<clears throat> hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, we'll just uh, uh, we we'll, we just get online. We'll just get this uh, presentation start um, in a couple of minutes. We'll wait for uh, some folks to join, and there are a lot of folks that are dialing in right now. So let's give a couple of minutes, and we'll get the session start. Okay, uh, good morning everyone and uh, welcome to uh, the AHR webinar series, uh, Low GWP Refrigerant Applications. Uh, I'm Xu Dong Wang, AHRI uh, Vice President of Research. I'm very excited uh, to have you here uh, today to have a conversation about um, the relevant safety standards and uh, some of our, our latest research results uh, related to uh, commercial uh, refrigeration equipment. Uh, so before we start uh, our session, I just want to have a couple of uh, housekeeping items. And uh, so first of all, the, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, we will make uh, the recorded session available uh, in the future. Uh, everybody um, is also muted. So um, please use the, the Q&A button uh, at the bottom of the screen <laughs> for our comments and questions at any time. Uh, we will leave about uh, maybe 10, uh, 15 minutes or so in the end to respond to them. Uh, if we don't have enough time to address them all, and we will get back to you uh, by email. So without further ado, let's get uh, our session uh, started. So uh, uh, joining us today um, uh, are three experts uh, who have been uh, closely working with the AHRI on the refrigerant testing projects. And uh, um, uh, next, please. And uh, so we have um, um, Tim Anderson um, um, with uh, Hassman Corporation. Uh, Tim is the director of uh, principal engineering uh, for Hassman. And he has uh, 15 years of uh, experience uh, designing, uh, developing, and uh, testing refrigerated display cases. Uh, he is a member of the Canina Working Group 12 uh, for uh, UL CSA 60335-2-89. Uh, and uh, he is active with many uh, IEC, AHRI, and ASHRAE committees and working groups. And uh, we also have a uh, Mark Skicker split with uh, UL. Uh, Mark is a principal engineer, um, um, being involved with both uh, domestic and the international HVAC uh, certification for over 15 years. Uh, he has participated on several uh, previous and ongoing uh, low GWP refrigerant research projects. Uh, Mark is also a member of the uh, IEC committee on the uh, uh, functional safety aspects of electronic circuits. And then we also have uh, uh, Stephen Splezer uh, with uh, the Comores company. Uh, Stephen is a principal engineer uh, from um, uh, who uh, has spent the last 25 years working in HVACR applications. Uh, he is active in codes and the standards and a, vote, uh, and a voting member of the ASHRAE 15 and the 15-2 uh, committees. Uh, Tim, Mark, and Stephen, uh, welcome, and uh, thank you so much for joining us. So uh, next slide, please. And uh, so um, over the past three years, um, <clears throat> um, 
AHRI, uh, we, uh, AHRI re research arm uh, already has conducted many, many uh, whole room scale uh, refrigerant tests in uh, several uh, refrigerated display uh, cases. So uh, uh, if you uh, go to the next slide, you will see uh, the summary of the uh, the testing we have done, and you know we tested uh, many um, several um, uh, display cases with uh, um, A two L and A three refrigerants at multiple charge levels and different scenarios. So our testing goal uh, was to uh, generate uh, some test results and provide technical data to uh, relevant safety standard committees for updating standards. So, uh, uh, so Tim, I, I bet a lot of folks on this webinar heard a lot about uh, the standard 60335-2-89 uh, when it comes to uh, the commercial refrigerator uh, and uh, flammable refrigerants and so on. So. Um, um, depending on who you talk to, sometimes we hear uh, IEC 2-89, or sometimes we hear uh, UL 2-89. So, what are those two standards, and uh, and and are, are they the same? So, Tim, would you uh, give everybody a brief overview uh, of the requirements on the flammable refrigerants uh, in these standards? So, Tim? Um, yeah, thank you, Shadong. Let's uh, go to the next slide, please. Uh, again, my name is Tim Anderson. Um, today, I'm going to give you an introduction uh, to the flammable refrigerant requirements in both the IEC and uh, proposed ULCSA standards uh, 60335-2-89. Um, for the sake of brevity, I'll, re uh, I'll refer to those as just 2-89 to, to keep that a little bit shorter. So, next slide, please. So uh, standard 2-89 is the product safety standard for commercial refrigeration equipment. On the international level, the IEC maintains standard 2-89 and edition three was released just last year. Uh, in North America, Canina, which is an organization focused on um, electrotechnical standard harmonization activities within the Americas. Uh, they work with both UL and the Canadian Standards Organization, CSA to oversee the US and Canadian version of the standard. So Canina, UL, and CSA have the ability to write in national deviations to the IEC version. And although they try to limit this as much as possible, at times revisions and additions to the technical content are necessary. So I will talk about these deviations more specifically in the coming slides relative to flammable refrigerants. So next slide, please. Um, starting with the new IEC edition 3 of 2-89, the single most significant change in this edition was the increase in the charge limits for flammable refrigerants used in commercial refrigeration equipment. So importantly, flammable refrigerants are only allowed in self-contained equipment. The charge limit for flammables is 13 times the LFL or the lower flammability limit uh, of the refrigerant or 1.2 kilograms, whichever is less. As you can see for R290, which has a, an LFL of uh, 0.038, this is approximately 500 grams, a little bit less than that, or 1.1 pounds. Um, due to their higher uh, LFL values, effectively the 1.2 kilogram cap only applies to A2L refrigerants. So the IEC committee that uh, worked on the, the standard revision decided on the 1.2 kilogram cap for A2Ls prior to much of the research on those refrigerants uh, use in commercial refrigeration equipment becoming published. So with this lack of information at the time, the committee kind of erred on the side of caution. Uh, 1.2 kilograms was chosen as a limit because that's roughly the amount required to achieve about the same refrigeration capacity as R290 in a piece of equipment with uh, density differences between those refrigerants taken into account. So as with all of the charge limits, um, this is applicable to just a single refrigeration system. Uh, 
and uh, you know, an appliance like a display case or a storage cabinet could use more than one uh, separate system. And you see that today with the current 150 gram charge limit. So next slide, please. So for an equipment manufacturer to use more than that previous limit of 150 grams of a flammable refrigerant, uh, there are new construction requirements that must be met. Um, tubing containing the refrigerant must be protected from damage. Uh, the system must be hermetically sealed at the factory. So there's no um, field brazing or anything like that uh, to uh, install a piece of equipment. Um, the minimum allowable room size for the piece of equipment must be marked on it. And uh, probably most importantly, the appliance must be constructed so that a leak of refrigerant shall not result in a flammable refrigerant concentration surrounding it. You ask, well, how do you, how do, you do that? Well, uh, a test was developed and that was placed in a new Annex CC in the IEC version of the standard. And uh, we're going to look at that more uh, here in a second. Uh, it's important to note in that test, if there are integral air moving devices, you know, a fan um, that are used to accomplish that, they can be used in that Annex CC test. So let's, uh, let's go to the next slide. And we'll go into some of the details of that Annex CC test. Um, so the, the purpose of this test, you know, because an equipment manufacturer does not have any control over the existence of potential ignition sources outside or, or adjacent to that appliance, this is really to simulate a refrigerant leak and measure the concentration of refrigerant around the piece of equipment to ensure that the design is safe. Uh, manufacturers have all the, all the control over the, you know, electrical components and things on board but really nothing outside of that footprint. So that's why this test was created. So the test is conducted in a room between seven to 24 square meters. Uh, a simulated leak of refrigerant um, is introduced from a, a critical point. So think of something like a braze return bend on a coil. And that's done either internal or external to the appliance. For internal leaks on a closed cabinet, uh, a door or drawer is opened 30 seconds after that leak has uh, finished. Um, to uh, pass the test, the concentration of the refrigerant in the air at any of the eight sensor locations called out by the standard cannot exceed 50% of the lower flammability limit of that refrigerant for five minutes or more. So that's your uh, pass fail criteria. So um, now let's move over to the North American version of standard 2-89. Uh, the current released version of the standard um, uh, aligns with the previous version of the IEC, which allows up to 150 grams of flammable refrigerant per system. Uh, however, as soon as the new IEC edition three was released in the middle of 2019, a Canina project with AHRI and also UL and CSA support was open to create a new version of the standard. So this new Canina working group, working group 12, uh, worked pretty tirelessly from uh, September of 2019 through June of this year to complete a draft of ULCSA 2-89 for the standards development and public review process. Currently this draft is scheduled to go into CSAs and UL's public review and ballot process in about a month from now. Um, that step is a 60-day process. Um, all of the public review comments will then be resolved um, uh, by the working group. If substantive changes are required, that process will be repeated and it will go to another ballot. Um, if not, the draft will move on to publication. So right now, the, the schedule for final publication of that ULCSA standard is scheduled for about April of 2021 that's assuming a second balloting phase is required. It could happen sooner as possible. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. Um, so relative to flammable refrigerants, let's look at some of the proposed um, national deviations placed in the UL CSA draft by Working Group 12. 
Uh, we'll start with the Yannick CC test. Um, clarification has been added for appliances that are uh, don't go up against a wall, ones that are meant to have access on more than one side. So think of like an island case in the middle of a, with, with an aisle on either side. Uh, additionally, instructions have been added for testing ice machines. Um, the refrigerant concentration center in front of the cabinet has been moved from half a meter to one meter away. This was done to account for the aisle space that must be in front of the appliance and the fact that it's very unlikely for a potential ignition source to be present in that aisle or walkway at any given time. Finally, the compliance criteria has changed slightly. For external leaks, the concentration at any of the sensor locations cannot exceed 50% of the lower flammability limit at any time. And for internal leaks, um, only, you know, once that door or drawer is opened, only the sampling point one meter in front of the appliance can have a concentration over 50% of LFL for up to five minutes. All the other sensor locations cannot exceed 50% of LFL at any point. Oh, let us get caught back up here. So um, let's go ahead and go to the next one. Okay. Um, so there are also some proposed changes to the flammable refrigerant charge limits. For closed equipment with doors or drawers, um, only eight times LFL is allowed. This is uh, approximately 300 grams of R290 and around 2.4 kilograms for a typical A2L refrigerant. For open cases, the charge limit uh, remains at 13 times LFL or you know, about 500 grams of 290 um, or about 3.9 kilograms of an A2L. Uh, so Due to the um, AHRTI research projects on A2L refrigerants uh, that are going to be covered later in this webinar, the 1.2 kilogram cap on A2Ls has been removed. So um, probably the most significant difference uh, between the ULCSA standard and the IEC standard is that A2L refrigerants can be used in remote condensing systems with additional mitigation requirements. Um, so there are three basic charge limit thresholds that have been established uh, that kind of uh, dictate uh, what mitigation steps have to have to be in place. Um, what we call M1 are basically those charge limits are the same as what you see for the, the self-contained equipment. That's eight times LFL for uh, closed equipment and 13 times LFL uh, for open equipment. M2 is equal to uh, 52 times LFL uh, to give you a feel for what that is for uh, an average A2L. That's about 15 and a half kilograms. And M3 is up to um, is 260 times LFL. And that's uh, about 78 kilograms um, or, you know, roughly maybe 170 pounds of uh, an A2L. So keep in mind that Flammable refrigerant charges above M1 are only allowed for A2L refrigerants, not for A3s. Next slide, please. Uh, mitigation measures uh, that are required when using um, charge sizes of an A2L larger than M1 include the following. Uh, you must have a refrigerant detection system that triggers prior to the concentration of leaked refrigerant reaching 25% of the LFL and the location of those sensor, that sensor or sensors must be validated with a test. Um, safety shutoff valves must be used to limit the releasable charge by confining the system volume exposed to the leakage point. So uh, remote condensing equipment such as a display case still have to comply with the test in the Annex CC. Uh, the sensor and shutoff valves therefore have to limit the amount of refrigerant that can leak out of the system so that a flammable concentration does not exist outside the piece of equipment. And finally, air circulation and or ventilation in the space is also required. Um, those can be either continuous or triggered by a refrigerant detection system. Next slide. So uh, furthermore, you know, based on 
research conducted on A2L refrigerants in recent years, um, the requirements for electrical components are not quite as strict uh, when using those refrigerants as opposed to using an A3 like R290. Um, hot surfaces when using an A2L uh, are limited to 700 degrees C as compared to like 370 degrees C for R290, so that's a pretty big difference. Uh, mechanical relays and similar components normally considered a potential ignition source are allowed with A2Ls if the openings in the device are sufficiently small or if they are contained in a flame arrest enclosure. And this is because a flame cannot physically propagate outside of the device in those instances. Additionally, um, switching devices with a switched electrical load below a certain level are also not considered potential ignition sources for A2L refrigerants. Next slide, please. So to evaluate the effectiveness of the mitigation techniques used in the 2-89 and the 2-40 standard for uh, air conditioning equipment, HRTI project uh, 9015 was initiated. For commercial refrigeration equipment, the, the project's purpose was really to validate the mitigation um, and, and techniques and test methods in the IEC version of 2-89 and to help inform any national deviations being proposed in the UL and CSA version. So for this project, uh, one and three door commercial refrigerators were tested using both an A3 R290 and an A2L R454C, uh, which is a blend of R32 and R1234YF. So the next speakers are gonna go into more uh, detail on this project as well as um, AHRTI project 9013. Next slide, please. So briefly, before I hand things back to Shadong, um, let's take a look at the design of this test. Uh, the room areas used for um, the test corresponded to the minimum allowable room areas per the IEC standard based on the charge levels. A room height of 2.5 meters was used. Sensors were placed in the locations required by Annex CC with some additional sensors added to gather more data. And you can see the Annex CC uh, sensor locations on the figure at the right there. Uh, in addition to the charge size and refrigerant changes, both empty and 75% loaded cabinet test results were evaluated as well as the condenser fan or fans being either on or off. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll thank you for your time and we'll go back to Shidong to introduce the next speaker. Shidong, I think you're on mute. Oh, sorry, yeah. Hey, thanks Tim for uh, the excellent overview of, of the standards and how we design our testing uh, to uh, to assess some of the, the key uh, parameters here. Uh, well, everybody, now let's hear from Mark about um, you know how uh, he he and his team actually uh, conducted the test at UL and 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 what kind of results they they they, they have here. All right, Mark, Mark, please take it away from here. Thanks, Shudong. Um yeah, and, and like Tim mentioned, um, we're going to be kind of reviewing some of the results uh, in accordance with um, um, the, the refrigeration testing for AHRTI Project 9015. And, and really, the initial goal, or I'm sorry, can we go to the next slide, please? The, the initial goal of this project was, was really to look at that Annex CC um, compliance criteria and, and if equipment could could meet that. So today we're going to go over um, really quickly some of the test parameters, some of the some of the items we varied. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, room setup and the the sensor arrangement uh, for the refrigeration tests that were conducted. And then finally we're going to dive into um, some of the actual data and look at um, some of the specific cases of, of um, conditions that you know, we, we reviewed as part of the ongoing uh, test program or, or part of the test program as it was ongoing. Uh, next slide, please. So the intent of this project is to validate and determine if appliances with larger charge amounts could comply with the tests identified in Annex CC. Uh, we looked at both 
um, internal and external leaks in this project, as Tim mentioned. Uh, for the external leaks, uh, we concentrated on lower condenser units, and um, we'll see in the next portion of this webinar uh, some details on, on why this specific approach was, was taken. Um, the design of the test program looked at several different variables. Uh, we tested both uh, single and three-door reaching coolers, uh, not necessarily as a comparison between the constructions, but instead as a representative test sample. Um, we were instead looking with those different geometries how the refrigerant was released into the room. Uh, we looked at the effect of product being placed in the conditioned space. Um, the comparison was between an empty rack unit and a cabinet with a 75% fill. Uh, we'll review some of this data um, specific to this um, shortly. Uh, there was also three different room areas um, varied corresponding to the minimum room area uh, specified in Annex CC for the refrigerant charges. And finally, we'll look at the effect of condenser fan operation during both internal and uh, the external releases. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide shows the general room layout for the test. Um, on the left, we have a top-down view of the sensor locations. Uh, locations with a blue fill are sensors specified by the standard. Uh, locations with no color fill are additional data points recorded for this specific test program. Uh, additional instrumentation also included um, omnidirectional anemometers to ensure that there was no outside influence of airflow in the test space. Uh, the bulk of these sensors are located 50 millimeters above the floor. Uh, the exception is the three sensor array um, on the bottom, which has two sensors located near the same point um, at approximately, or I shouldn't say approximately, at 50 and 150 millimeters above the floor. Uh, these additional sensor locations were chosen to better understand how the refrigerant propagates uh, into the room. The um, internal leak tests were conducted, uh, were specified by Annex CC to represent the refrigerant charge being leaked into the interior of the space um, of the appliance and then introduced into the room by opening of a door. As a representative worst case, we chose the rightmost door as it would provide the highest refrigeration concentration um, at the sensor locations. The image on the right shows the medium room layout. Uh, this same sort of sensor arrangement was scaled for each room and unit size. Um, in this image, you may also be able to make out um, the 75% shelf space fill. Um, when we originally started looking at that 75%, um, you know, we, we, we started putting the bottles in and then realized very quickly that a 75% area fill for the shelf is, is pretty substantial. It doesn't leave much um, extra space um, to, uh, to, to place additional products. So when, even though we talk about a 75% fill, um, if I were to compare this to you know, a typ typical convenience store or grocery store uh, for these type of products, that's what I would expect to see when I would consider the cabinet to be full of, of products. Uh, next slide. We're gonna talk a little bit about the test setup here. Um, as we identified earlier, the refrigerant charge was scaled with the room size. Uh, two refrigerants were chosen, R454C as an A2L and 290 as an A3. Uh, the charge size for each of the rooms is, is shown on the right. It was important that the refrigerant was released into the cabinet as a slightly superheated refrigerant to ensure that there was no pooling of liquid refrigerant in the cabinet um, in order to do this, we heated the discharge line after uh, expansion to ensure that we had um, approximately the, uh, the 35 degrees C dew point required by the standard. Uh, to ensure that we didn't leak any refrigerant out of the interior uh, before the door was opened, uh, we sealed the condensate drains in the appliance. Um, and so we would only see leaking of refrigerant if it were to um, come out of the unit through um, through seams or through, through door gas or bypassing the door gaskets. Uh, the leaks were simulated near expected critical points of the appliance, uh, regardless of the specific construction. In a review of these systems, uh, worst cases were identified as evaporator and condenser uh, return bins. And we use these both for um, the two different size units as well as um, the internal and external leaks. For the internal, uh, um, leak, uh, the release is introduced into the cabinet. Uh, the rate is a function of the properties of the refrigerant 
as well as uh, the system charge. Most release times were anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes. Now, after the release has been completed, um, 30 seconds after the release is completed, the door is opened and then held in that open condition. Uh, next slide. Now we're gonna get into um, some of the specific data and some of the specific results. Um, the next several slides are gonna look very similar. So I'd like to review a few items before diving into the data. Uh, the main axis of the majority of these slides will show time in seconds from the door opening. So negative time is prior to door opening, but the release is occurring. Um, positive time is, is the time after the door opens. Uh, the vertical axis is shown in volume fraction as a percentage of refrigerants at the sensor. Uh, for the most part, we're going to be reviewing A2L refrigerants, and I've made an effort to keep the scale consistent. I'll, I'll note when this uh, vertical axis scale changes. Uh, the green vertical line identifies the five-minute period after opening. Uh, per the requirements in Annex CC of IEC 2-89, all required sensor values need to be below 50% LFL. Uh, which is indicated by the blue dotted line in, in this chart. Um, now, Tim just mentioned that there were some changes uh, made to the North American version of the standard. Um, the, um, the red dotted dash line um, is also put on this chart in order to show um, a 75% LFL reference points. And then uh, the black solid line is uh, the LFL for the specific refrigerants. Uh, the inset chart shows slightly more detail on the sensor at that point of the door opening. Uh, this usually is anywhere from 150 to 200 um, second period. Um, all the data here is a three second averaged and then deconvoluted value. Um, it's because of this deconvolution that we see some of the, some of the quote unquote noise in the signal. Um, this is not um, an artifact, this is not the sensor itself, but just an artifact of the post recording data processing. Um, also shown on the slides is a reference to the sensor location uh, in the lower left corner. So you can see from this specific test, uh, we're looking at the, um, the required sensor that's closest to the door that's being opened. Um, also is a summary of the, uh, the refrigerant release values. Now, getting into the data. Uh, we discussed a few slides ago that one of the parameters that we were investigating was the shelf loading of the specific products. Um, with this specific test, we can see that prior to the door opening, we are getting some leakage into the room. Uh, we're seeing that that's slightly more with the 75% fill, which is the kind of peach color line, uh, but that's not necessarily a statistically significant value. After the release, we're seeing the same effect. Uh, the 75% spill has slightly higher value, um, which could be a result of the higher concentration of refrigerant being released slower into the space, uh, possibly due to the restriction of the product on the shelf. Let's go to the next slide. So this is the same test setup, um, same sensor location, but instead now we've gone to the medium sized room, the 18 square meter room with a 2.3 kilogram charge. Uh, once again, we see a similar increase uh, at the refrigerant sensor prior to door openings for the test with the shelf loading. We also see very similar decrease after the door opening. Note that for the detailed data, we are seeing very similar profiles of refrigerant release regardless of product placement on the shelf. Uh, this indicates to me that even though there may be slightly different concentrations, we're still seeing the same type of release profile into the, the room space. Next slide, please. Uh, now with this next slide, um, we haven't changed the test conditions. We're still looking at the medium room with 2.3 kilograms. Um, instead, now we're looking at the sensor a little bit further out into, into the space. So this specific sensor is 1.25 meters from the front of the cabinet and is located 150 millimeters above the floor. Uh, with this sensor, we're seeing very similar results. Uh, we're seeing the same rise in refrigerants, um, as well as the slightly higher, but still similar response after the door opens. Um, for these tests we have reviewed so far, the, the effect of the product placement on the shelf does not have an effect on the compliance requirements in the standard, either 
um, with regards to the IEC or the proposed uh, UL standard. The, val the, the values for all the sensors are still uh, above the LFL. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Now, um, I'm going to show here the, the same tests we were just talking about, medium room, uh, empty versus 75% fill. Uh, but what we're going to be looking at here is the A3 refrigerant, so the R290. So please note the scale change um, on, on the vertical axis. So this was 300 grams of refrigerant. Once again, same process being released into the cabinet. Uh, at the conclusion of the release, um, 30 seconds um, later, we'll, we'll open the door and hold that door in the open position. Um, so for the A3 refrigerants, we didn't see um, the same effect of refrigerant leaking into the space um, prior to uh, this door opening. Um, this was likely an effect of the smaller uh, volume for the refrigerant charges themselves. Um, we're also seeing slightly better mixing into the room. Uh, the data on this, this specific slide is a sensor located outside um, the path of the main refrigerant release. Um, in this case, we have seen similar, refrig re, uh, similar refrigerant values initially, um, but in this specific case, um, the, the 290 case, uh, the 75% product placement uh, decays slightly faster. However, well, once again, all the sensors, uh, all the required sensors are above the LFL at, um, at the five minute period. Now, because we didn't see significant differences between the shelf loading conditions, uh, the tests moving forward were, were conducted using um, just empty shelves. Uh, this provides for a simpler test setup, which, um, which we certainly enjoyed, um, but it also allowed us to investigate in more details um, some of the other uh, properties and other variables in, in the test program. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. Now, while we did conduct uh, testing with the A3 refrigerants for the other conditions, uh, moving forward, at least for the purpose of this presentation, um, we're going to be um, mainly looking at our, or I shouldn't say um, mainly, we are going to only be looking at the R454C. Um, the profiles were similar um, uh, between the two refrigerants and the R454C uh, provides a little bit better resolution um, just based on uh, the charge release into the space. Um, these next few slides we're gonna be looking at um, compare the results of the testing across uh, the three main room sizes or the three room sizes. Uh, we've gone back to the A2L, so, so please note the vertical scale change. This slide shows the sensor closest to the door opening. We see slightly more refrigerants at the sensor uh, before the door is opened for the medium and large rooms. Um, this is a result of the larger charge sizes pushing out of the cabinet. However, even at the 1.1 kilogram charge for the small room, we see a pronounced inflection point where the refrigerant starts to burp out of the unit. Now, after the doors open, we continue to see higher refrigerant concentrations for the, the larger charges. Uh, note here that all the refrigerant charges are still above the LFL at the, the five minute period. Let's go to the next slide. So this is the same test setup, um, same conditions. Um, so we're comparing still one point uh, across all three room sizes and all three charge sizes. Um, the sensor itself is on the opposite side of the unit. But what's important to note with this is the results are very similar. We still have the same increases prior to the door opening, although the rate of increase is, is slightly different, which is expected. It's not as localized to a specific um, um, opening of the unit because it's located around the side. Um, we do see slightly higher peak values for the medium and large room release. But um, in any case, we're still seeing on, even on the opposite side of the unit um, from where we're opening the door, we're still seeing those values above the LFL. Um, this specific slide was interesting to me because it showed that the sensors around the unit are similar. And uh, the test method that we chose by opening the rightmost door does not prevent refrigerant from reaching other parts of the room. So that kind of leads us to the question, does the refrigerant is the refrigerant only localized near the unit? Um, we expect 
the refrigerant would flow out the unit and along the floor due to gravity. And this is in fact what we do see. Um, if we go to the next slide, once again, we're still talking about the same setup, only now looking at the sensor that's furthest out into the room. Uh, so this sensor, just like we had looked at before, is um, 1.25 meters in front of the unit. And we see, you know, once again, a very similar profile for the release. The values here are slightly lower than the concentration values shown on the previous slides. And that is more due to the fact that this specific sensor is 150 millimeters above the floor. If we would have instead looked at the sensor at the same location that was only 50 millimeters above the floor, we would see the values being um, even closer to what was shown on the previous slide. So from these slides, we don't see a significant difference in concentration values when we look to scale uh, the room with the charge. Um, going to the next slide, we're going to start to look at um, the effect of airflow. Now, airflow for these units was based on um, standard commercially available uh, condensing units that would be expected um, with, with these products. We then were able to um, take those expected values and then scale them for the refrigerant charges that we had. Now, in all actuality, in all practicality, there will be an upper limit um, on um, volumetric flow rates for uh, condensing units just based on customer expectations um, actually in the field. Now, the blue line, uh, the fan offline, is, is the same data that we had seen in previous slides when we were comparing the different rooms. So if we compare that data that we saw to the data with fan on, um, whether it be at the, the expected value or slightly higher than expected value, we see that we don't have the same sort of refrigerant concentration building up um, in front of the unit uh, prior to the door opening. And that's to be expected because we are having some circulation in there. So any refrigerant that may be leaking out of the door seams is in fact being circulated in the space. Now, after the door is opening, we do see um, a pronounced drop in the refrigerant values at that area. Once again, we're looking at that airflow mixing up uh, the refrigerant and dispersing it throughout the room. If we go to the next slide, we can confirm that. Once again, we'll go to our sensor that's um, 1.25 meters out into the room. Uh, and we see very similar results. Prior to the release, um, we do not see um, you know, the concentration building up like we had with the, with the fan off. And then uh, as well, after the test, um, we see the situation where um, with that fan on, uh, the refrigerant is being uh, dispersed more readily into the room. And as a matter of fact, we can see that it drops uh, close to that 50% LFL value um, within five minutes uh, of the test. So this was for the medium room with 2.3 kilograms. As we go to the next slide, uh, we're gonna be going up to the larger room and, um, and the larger charge size. So when we did the larger charge size, we, we scaled that value um, based on, once again, the expected charge or the expected airflow for a condensing unit. Um, now it may not be practical to have, um, to have this sort of airflow uh, with a self-contained unit. But once again, the, the intent was to scale that airflow with what could be allowed for the standard within one, within one circuit, the, the maximum of the three points, um, eight kilograms of refrigerant. And we see that when we use the nominal airflow and even slightly lower than nominal airflow, which is the green and the, the peach colored lines, we see um, no significant buildup of uh, refrigerants at the sensor location compared to the fan off. And we also see dramatically um, faster decay of refrigerants into the space. And actually this would be one of those situations where um, we actually would comply with the requirements in the standard with this, um, with this fan on. We go to the next slide. Um, once again, we'll see the same sort of thing. We're now looking at the sensor that's 1.25 meters in front of the unit. And we see very similar results to, to what was expected where we have um, very little refrigerant charge buildup and then uh, a fast decay. So regardless of the fact uh, of whether we're, took, whether we're looking at sensors very close to the release point or actually further out into the room, uh, we're seeing very consistent values. So that airflow um, 
it, in, and what we're seeing here is it it's, doesn't seem to be, uh, at least with the values we chose, we're not near the critical points of the airflow. We're seeing well mixing uh, within the entire room space. Uh, next slide. So everything we've talked about so far has been an internal uh, leak. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about um, some external leaks that we conducted. So with this specific um, three-door unit, um, with the, just based on the size and the cooling capacity of the unit, uh, typically these have uh, multiple condensing units. So in this condition, uh, we simulated um, uh, the left condensing fan being on and the leak occurring on the right condensing unit. Now, with these typical arrangements, we see uh, the, the condensing units blowing into the interior or, or, or going to the center of the unit. Um, the green arrow shows the direction and approximate location of the condenser fan, and then the blue arrow shows uh, the approximate location of the, um, the condenser leak. Now, when we did our leak, um, we specifically um, placed the discharge um, at the condenser itself in order to um, to minimize the effect of any momentum that the refrigerant would have coming out of the tube. The, the intent was not to have a jet of refrigerant shooting into the room, but um, instead you know, represent what, what, what was expected to happen uh, with the refrigerant leak. So let's go to the next slide. Now the scale here does change because once again, we don't have that door opening, but what we can see is um, with the sensor, um, with the fan off and with on, we see significant uh, differences between those. We, we certainly see a concentration difference um, from the start of the test to the end of the test with both conditions. But with that fan on, um, we see um, you know, a value below 50% of the LFL. Now this specific sensor is located um, away from the direction that the fan was blowing, um, as well as, as, as the furthest sensor away from uh, the discharge location itself. But what we can see by going to the next slide is when we look at that sensor location that's closest to that leak point, we really don't see significant difference. There is slightly different um, concentrations, but as far as the gross outcomes of the test, whether it would consider to comply or not comply with the requirements of the standard, we really don't see a difference based on that sensor location um, as opposed to um, the airflow being the, the dominating factor. So in summary, um, if we go to the next slide. So with this test, we were able to validate um, that, uh, that the test method in IEC um, Annex CC, or IEC 2-89 Annex CC um, did have the effect of showing that there were refrigerant concentrations when the door was open. Um, the big takeaway from this was um, for me that the refrigerant concentrations at those sensor locations, uh, the required sensor locations were in excess of the requirements in the standard with the exception of that airflow. So from the parameters we talked about at the very beginning of, uh, at, uh, of, this, of this portion, um, the factors that we really didn't see having a significant impact on, on, the, uh, on the project were uh, the single door versus three door. We saw very similar results. Um, we also didn't see a difference really going from uh, the various room sizes when we scaled the refrigerant charge with that. Um, and then we didn't see a difference with the case loading. Like I noted, there were some slight differences between them, but not enough uh, to really have um, you know, a big impact on compliance results, uh, regardless of, of their statistical uh, significance. Now, what we saw with these last couple of slides was the more significant impact was that condenser fan operation or airflow to distribute that refrigerant um, within that space. And Chudong, um, that's all I have. I think uh, back to you. Uh, uh, Mark, thank you uh, for the uh, great presentation here. And I just want to interject one point about the external release um, and test. And the, the refrigerant leak rate in the testing, uh, we actually determined uh, 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 determined the leak rate using the uh, standard 2-89 uh, defined formula. And so uh, uh, for a specific charge level, uh, we tested uh, uh, one leak rate. Uh, to that point, um, I want to um, introduce another uh, RD project, uh, which actually tested uh, three levels of leak rate uh, for a specific charge level. 
uh, to basically simulate the large and medium and the small leaks and, and so on. So Stephen, uh, you were the, uh, the key member of the technical committee uh, guiding that project. So would you um, provide us with an overview of the project and, uh, and our findings? Sure. Thank you, Zhidong, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Uh, next slide, please. So today we're going to talk about the results of the RD 9013 study, which was completed last year. And this study was performing flammable refrigerant leak and ignition testing with a focus on commercial refrigeration applications. And for the scenarios we tested, we used a four-door refrigerated display case to simulate leaks and ignitions. Now, one of the main goals of this study was to do a direct apple-to-apple -apple comparison in as much as possible of the refrigerant leak and ignition testing behavior of an A2L versus an A3 refrigerant using the same test setup and the same test methodology. And here we used R454C, an A12 blend, and R290, which is refrigerant grade propane. And this study built upon an existing body of work that had previously been performed by the NFPA in 2017 with ignition testing of propane. And it's important to note that what we're looking at here are near worst case scenarios where we're trying to create the conditions to force an ignition to occur, see what happens, learn from that, and report that back into the standard development process. That's really our main goal is to help inform the standards. Next slide, please. So this is a quick comparison of the refrigerant properties. We have R290, our representative A3, and R454C, our representative A2L. And one of the first properties I want to point out, I've highlighted in blue, is the molecular weight. And what you see is that the molecular weight of R454C is twice that, roughly, of propane. And this has an impact on refrigerant charge sizes but it also has an impact on how the refrigerant disperses into a space once you have a leak. Now, in red, I've highlighted a couple thermodynamic properties, the vapor pressure and the capacity of the refrigerants. And here you see that they are very close. So we don't believe these played a major role in the results we're finding. But where there are bigger differences is the flammability parameters. In brown, I've highlighted the lower flammability limit, or LFL and the minimum ignition energy, or MIE. And what you can see is that these values are much higher for 454C than for propane. For the LFL, both on a volume percent and a concentration of mass in the space, the values are much higher for 454C. You have to leak out about eight times as much on a mass basis to form a flammable concentration. So from a practical standpoint, uh, you'd expect you might be less likely to form a flammable concentration from a leak of 454C. Also, the minimum ignition energy is orders of magnitude higher than for, for 454C than with propane, and propane can be ignited by static electricity. So you would expect you're going to need a much stronger ignition source to ignite the A2L refrigerant. There are fewer things that will actually be able to ignite it out there in the field. Uh, on the flip side, though, if we look at the burning velocity and the heat of combustion, which I've highlighted in purple, these values are much higher for propane. Um, basically, what that suggests from a theoretical standpoint is that if you have an ignition with propane, the flames will spread much more rapidly and you'll have more heat being given off by the combustion process. So in theory, ignition events with propane would be expected to be more severe. Next slide, please. So that's the refrigerant. This is the actual test setup that was used, pictured on the top right. The same contractor that performed the NFPA study in 2017 was used to perform the RD9013 study, and that was Gexcon. However, they had to build a new test rig for the RD9013 study because the previous test rig had been damaged by the propane ignitions. So they had to make some changes to ensure that the test rig remained uh, solid. One of those was they added five vents to reduce pressure rise from the ignitions. And you can see those in the top right of the picture as the plastic sheeting over those window-like openings that will give way when you reach a certain pressure or when they're hit by the flames. They also use stainless steel plating on the interior surface of the test rig to allow for easier cleanup after refrigerant ignitions. 
and the test enclosure was well sealed and insulated to minimize convective effects or air infiltration. We really wanted to look at a still quiescent environment here to really focus on the results of the refrigerant dispersions and ignitions. The same model of display case was used as was used in the NFPA study. This was a four door case that came with a factory charge of 900 grams of propane. And several dispersion and ignition tests were repeated with propane to confirm consistency with the previous NFPA study. And what we found was there was excellent agreement in the results between these two studies. Next slide, please. So the charge sizes and leak rates used in this study were changed based on the refrigerant properties. As I mentioned previously, R454C is heavier or denser than propane. So if you're basically having the same size appliance with roughly the same capacity, you would expect you're going to have about the same volume of liquid. And on that basis of volume equivalence, you would have twice as much refrigerant on a mass basis with the 454C because of its higher density. And that's shown in the charge sizes in the table on the bottom right. Similarly, the leak rates were also scaled. Um, these rates were based on choke flow with the same size holes. But when you consider the refrigerant properties such as density, you end up with higher leak rates for the 454C, roughly two thirds higher. Now there are a couple items that I've highlighted in the table that I wanna point out. We also tested 150 grams for each refrigerant. As this is the baseline or a maximum that is currently allowed in several safety standards for flammable refrigerants. And I've also highlighted the 1.2 kilograms for 454C that was tested. As this is the current limit currently allowed by the International IEC 60335-2-89 standard. And we wanted to make sure that we covered that point. Next slide, please. So from an instrumentation, instrumentation standpoint, on the top right, we're showing an overview of the dispersion test where we have the display case in the room with oxygen sensors spread throughout at different locations and heights. And we did this so we can map out the size and scope of the refrigerant cloud in the room to determine whether or not you actually had a flammable concentration present. In the bottom right, we're looking at the test setup for ignition testing. Here, many of the concentration sensors have been removed, but you've added heat flux sensors, pressure transducers, and thermocouple trees at various heights and locations, again, to try and gauge the size and scope of an ignition event should it occur. And finally, at the bottom, I'm showing the ignition sources, which were oscillating spark transformers. These are very strong ignition sources that are capable of igniting flammable concentrations of each refrigerant. And the height of the igniters was adjusted to make sure that they were present within flammable layers that were formed with the refrigerants. Next slide, please. So this is the dispersion test protocol. In both the NFPA study and in the RD9013 study, 48 dispersion tests were performed for the refrigerant. And these were low momentum external releases, basically simulating a leak from the condensing unit out into the space, as opposed to a leak inside the refrigerated cabinet. Now, we wanted low momentum releases. We didn't want a jet to spray out into the room because at these leak rates, you would get good mixing and you'd be unlikely to form a flammable concentration. Instead, we wanted to simulate a leak that impinged upon a surface, such as the condensing unit housing, to remove momentum from the leak so the refrigerant would basically fall down and you'd be more likely to form a flammable concentration, more of a worse case. These low momentum releases were done at both the top and the bottom of the display case to simulate the presence of a top or bottom mounted condensing unit. They were done at four different charge sizes and three different leak rates, which we discussed previously. And they were done both with the condenser fan on and off so that we could see the impact of using air circulation as a mitigation measure. Next slide, please. So this is our first eye chart. This is a summary of the dispersion test results. And what I want you to focus on are the pink boxes and the orange boxes. 
the pink boxes are the scenarios where a flammable concentration was formed with propane. The orange boxes are the scenarios where a flammable concentration was formed with R454C. And what you can see is there are a lot fewer flammable concentrations formed with R454C. Next slide, please. Now, there were several learnings from the dispersion testing. One was that when you were releasing volume equivalent charges into the space, you form roughly the same volume concentration in the room. So for example, if a leak of propane resulted in 2% concentration in a room, if you used a volume equivalent charge of 454C, basically double the mass, you would get 2% 454C in the room as well. One of the big differences, however, is the LFL of 454C being significantly higher, you were less likely to have a flammable concentration form. We also found that when you did have a flammable concentration form of R454C, that the flammable layers were thinner. Part of that is due to the difference in charge sizes, but part of it is also due to 454C being heavier. And as it falls through the air, you get better mixing, so you're less likely to form that flammable concentration or you have a thinner layer form. For the top mount of releases, releases from the top condensing unit, what we found was that seven out of the 24 scenarios for R290 produced a flammable concentration. These were typically at the higher leak rates with the fan off. You didn't have any flammable concentrations formed from the top mounted releases with the fan on. However, for 454C, no flammable concentrations were formed at all, regardless of the leak rate or the fan being on or off. That's different, however, from the bottom mount of releases where flammable concentrations were formed for both refrigerants. This is more of a worst case. 13 out of the 24 scenarios form flammable concentrations with R290. Basically, all 12 of the scenarios where the condenser fan was off and one when the condenser fan was on. Only seven of the 24 scenarios, however, form flammable concentrations for R454C. And these were typically for the larger charge sizes and leak rates, such as 1,200 or 2,000 grams of 454C, and only when the condenser fan was off. So one of the big takeaways from these results is that the use of circulation air, such as a condenser fan, to mitigate the refrigerant releases can be very effective at minimizing or eliminating a flammable concentration from forming. Next slide, please. So this is our second eye chart. Once we knew where the flammable concentrations were forming, we tried to pick tests for the ignition testing where we could have an apple to apple comparison, the same test conditions for both refrigerants. One of the problems we ran into, however, is there weren't enough flammable concentrations with R454C to compare against propane with. Part of that was, was that a number of the flammable concentrations that formed with R54C were at the highest leak rates. And in the previous NFPA study, they didn't do ignition testing with propane at this highest leak rate. So we actually had to perform several of those ignitions for the first time as part of the RD9013 study in order to have enough tests for a good comparison of the ignition results. Next slide, please. So, this is a quick summary of the ignition testing for external releases outside of the display cabinet. Um, table 5.4 shows you the different refrigerants, whether it's a top or bottom mount of release, uh, the charge size, leak rates, whether the condenser fans on or off. And below the table is the results key that shows the level of ignition severity going from the lowest severity being a one with no ignition to five being flame propagation throughout the room with a larger ignition. So if you look at the figures, the pictures on the right side, here's what we found. When we initially did the ignition testing with 454C, all the results were either a one or two. You either had, you either had no ignition occur, and that was sometimes even when a flammable concentration was present, or you had small pencil-like flames extending up from the igniter, and these flames went out once the ignition source was removed. Now, this is different from some of the results we saw from the previous RD9007 studies, 
And one of the reasons for that was believed to be the fact that a number of those tests were done at higher humidity levels. And it's well known that you can increase the reactivity of some A2L refrigerants at higher humidity levels. You can get higher burning velocities from those products. So in order to create a worst case scenario for an external ignition with 454C, we took the largest charge size of 2000 grams and we increased the relative humidity in the space to near 100%. And we repeated the ignition test. When we did that, we got result three shown on the far right with 454C, where we did have an ignition that was able to sustain itself once the igniter was turned off. The flames were able to anchor to the cables and the wooden assembly, and they were able to spread slowly after the igniter was turned off. However, these results are all lower in severity than the ignition results obtained with propane, where you had either result four where the flame spread across the floor in front of the display case or result five where the flame spread throughout the room. So as you can see, there's a noticeable difference in the severity of these ignition events. Next slide, please. This looks at a little more detail of the results of the ignition testing. On the top left, you have 1200 grams of 454C and this was typical of the ignition results we achieved at that charge size. Now you can compare that to 150 grams of propane where basically that comparison, they're both the same LFL, approximately four times the LFL. Or you can compare it on volume equivalents, basically increasing the charge size to reflect the difference in density. But whether you're comparing the 1200 grams of 454C against 150 or 600 grams of propane, the ignition event severity is obviously lower with 454C. Now, for the worst case external ignition event with 2000 grams of 454C in high humidity, we compared that to 1000 grams of propane for volume equivalents. And again, you see there's a noticeable difference in the ignition severity. Next slide, please. So that was for external releases and the ignition events that resulted from those. We also wanted to look at what happens if we release the refrigerant inside the display case and then we open the door to allow the refrigerant charge to spill out with an igniter present. This is kind of one of the worst case scenarios. And you see we did testing with both 454C and with R290. Now the unit that we were testing had a factory charge of 900 grams of propane. So that was the charge size used for propane. We looked at both that same charge size of 900 grams for 454C and the volume equivalent charge size of 1800 grams. And the results we found are shown at the bottom of the slide. You can see if the results key, the lowest severity was a result of one with no ignition and the result four being the worst with a large ball of flame in and around the display case. And again, it's a similar story. What we found with 454C when we initially did the test is either we had no ignition or we had a few seconds of flow induced flame that went out after the refrigerant passed the igniter. So again, to try and make more of a worst case scenario, we increased the relative humidity in the space to near 100% and repeated the worst case of 1800 grams with 454C. And when we did that, we produced the, what's considered the only higher consequence ignition event with our 454C in this study. And that's the result three that's pictured here. There you were able to get an ignition that propagated along the floor and some of the flames went back into the display case However, this is significantly lower in severity than the propane ignition, which was result number four, where you see the large ball flame in and around the display case. So one of the goals was trying to gauge the relative severity of the 454C ignitions compared to propane. And we looked at this higher consequence ignition event, where again, we had 1800 grams of 454C that was dumped suddenly into the space through the door opening test. We had high humidity to increase the reactivity of the refrigerant, and we had turbulence from the spillage outside of the case that increased the flame velocity. And what we found with this higher consequence ignition event, that the fire size and radiative heat flux of 1800 grams of 454C was similar to that of the 150 grams of R290 during an external bottom release, or basically the baseline with propane. 
So basically you needed 12 times as much 454C with high humidity and turbulence to produce an ignition event similar in severity to that of 150 grams of propane. Next slide, please. So what did we learn from this? What were our conclusions? Well, when using volume equivalent charges, 454C formed fewer flammable concentrations than propane and none from top releases or when the condenser fan was on. And this is largely attributed to the higher LFL of R454C. 454C was also less likely to be ignited than propane. And this is largely due to the fact that higher ignition energies are typically required to ignite an A12 than an A3. And the ignition event severity was lower with 454C than with propane. This was both for volume equivalent and LFL equivalent charge sizes. We also found that you needed high humidity to produce a sustainable ignitions with 454C, one that would keep going after the igniters was turned off. And you needed the combination of high charge, high humidity, and turbulence to produce a higher consequence ignition event with R454C. So this study was completed last year. The report has been published and is available on the AHRI website. And the findings have been shared with groups working on the development of safety standards such as the IEC and Canina Working Group 12, working on the international and national versions of the 2-89 standard. Thank you. All right, uh, thanks uh, Stephen for uh, the great summary. And um, again, thanks all speakers for the talks. And uh, there's definitely a lot of the information um, uh, here. And so we got uh, several questions or comments coming in while we're talking and uh, uh, we have about maybe a f around five five minutes or so. Let's take a look at the uh, s some of them. Maybe uh, get some uh, simple ones squared away, and uh, and uh, the more complicated one um, we can uh, uh, respond through emails. So um, I guess the first uh, question uh, I guess is for uh, Tim. Um, and so uh, when you talk about the IEC uh, um, and the uh, sorry, the UL 2-89 proposal about charge level at M1. Uh, so if the, so the question is to understand correctly, uh, if the charge level is M1, then you do not need detection, shutout valve, and the ventilation. I, is this understanding correct? Yes, those, uh, those items are not prescribed you do need to pass the NXCC test. So if an equipment manufacturer finds that they need, um, they need air circulation from uh, like a condenser fan or an auxiliary fan on board the piece of equipment to pass that test, then that will have to be there. But there is no uh, prescription for um, detection or shutoff valves. Okay. Uh, thank you, Tim. And, um, and the next, uh, um, I think, a uh, couple questions uh, related to the testing, and I guess maybe Mark, you would be the one to answer is, um, were these uh, uh, tests with, with what we have done, and I, I guess for either Mark and uh, Stephen, and uh, for the RD9015 and uh, 9013, and uh, were these tests with continuous fan on or delayed fan on? And uh, also uh, whether, uh, you know, the, the, the refrigerant blend, uh, the fractionation would be a concern once the, the refrigerant released from the, uh, into the environment. Yeah, Shudong, I can certainly answer those two questions for the, the 9015 project. Um, yeah. The, the, the first one being for the, the fan operation. Um, when we did our releases, uh, when we were looking at the effect of airflow, the fan was on uh, the entire time. So we were looking uh, simply at the parametric value or the parametric effect of airflow versus no airflow. Um, the purpose of the scope of this project um, was not to, uh, to look at any sorts of um, sensor delay. And, and as we see in some of the requirements in, in 2-89, we, we don't have that same sort of approach where there's certain um, specific mitigation um, currently, uh, at least in the, in the IEC version. Now, whether that would be um, something that the industry feels they need, that's certainly something um, you know, that I, I, I feel um, could be updated in the standard in order to address um, how mitigation is handled. 
Now, with regards to um, blends and fractionation, uh, that was a concern that we had um, when we were doing our releases. So when we were doing the release, we were drawing from um, a liquid port on the tank. So we were actually drawing off liquid refrigerant um, and then expanding it. So we knew that we, were, we had, um, at least we were pulling out in the correct composition of the refrigerant um, and then it was expanding into um, a homogeneous cloud inside of that, um, that condenser, uh, or excuse me, inside the cabinet space. So I, I would expect, you know, after, um, you know, some time that you, you might be able to see some difference, but um, really the, the two refrigerant properties, we were, or two refrigerants we were looking at were so close. Now, if we were looking at, you know, maybe a long-term leak um, of, a, of an adiabatic leak on either um, on the vapor side, I can expect that we would see some variation in the, um, in the composition of the refrigerant, but with the, the fast release we were doing, or relatively fast, you know, 20 to 30 minutes, um, there was no, uh, no possibility for having some sort of uh, fractionation that would really deviate from the nominal composition. Yeah, and Judong, I'll just chime in that similar answers for the 9013 study, the when we were looking at the impact of air circulation, the condenser fan was on the whole time. And again, I agree with Mark on the fractionation issue. One other thing to point out is that you're leaking all of the refrigerant, for example, into the cabinet or into the space. So even if you do have some localized fractionation, you're getting all the refrigerant out there. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, I think, Greg, would you please um, uh, go to the next slide? Um, I, I think, uh, you know, we are running on slightly over. Um, apology for uh, uh, taking us a slightly longer than what we expected, but uh, uh, we know uh, uh, you, you, some of you have some additional thoughts. And uh, so here is the contact the information. Uh, uh, if you have regulatory related uh, questions, please contact Talon or in terms of the research, um, here is our uh, email um, and contact. And so um, um, uh, we will uh, address all the, uh, the, the questions and uh, still open uh, uh, through emails. And uh, I hope you um, 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 join us for the webinar three about the refrigerant sensor uh, next week. Uh, we thank you all for coming and we thank our speakers uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, bye now. Bye-bye.